and welcome to Civil War Digital Digest. I'm Andrew. Today we're going to be talking about the regimental staff during the Civil War. First, before we get going, I want to say thank you to the Historic Fort Wayne Coalition for giving us this space to work in today. And I want to say thank you to our patrons. Your financial support allows us to produce, to research, to go on location. And I want to say thank you so much. Regimental staff during the Civil War is something that often is not fully understood by people, whether reenactors, living historians, armchair historians, or people, or people with a modern military experience. There's a lot of little nuances to the regimental staff that people don't always understand. I want to take some time today to go through the positions of the staff and talk through their duties, responsibilities, and how, those, how their relationships differ, especially from some of the modern military relationships. One of the hard parts with living historians is taking modern military experiences and um, putting them on, projecting them onto the past instead of looking and see what the sources from the past tell them. As a note for regiment, battalion, most people in living history term know that these terms are pretty synonymous, but modern military, they're on different levels from each other. The only regiments in the Civil War that had multi-battalion regiments uh, were the f nine regiments of new army, regular army regiments that were raised at the beginning of the Civil War. Otherwise, otherwise all the regiments were single battalion units, and so those terms can really be used interchangeably. The first position I want to talk about is the colonel. The colonel is the commanding officer. He is the man. He is in charge. And in the sense of the Civil War, he's a lot more directly involved with the day-to-day -day operation of his unit than a modern commanding officer is. He's responsible for the administration and the government of the unit, as well as its tactical employment. In terms of off the battlefield, he's going to be the one that puts together the general orders, the special orders. They're going to be written by the adjutant, distributed by the adjutant, but it starts with him of his, his desires for how the regiment will be administered and to make sure to pass on orders that way. In terms of the government of the regiment, the colonel is going to be the one that is in charge of court-martials be in charge of regimental court marshals. He's going to be in charge of appointments of NCOs within the unit. He's going to be in charge of making recommendations for officer promotions for volunteer units where those are appointees by the governor. He's also going to make recommendations to the War Department if it's a regular army unit for which officer should be promoted. In terms of the battlefield, the colonel is the direct commander of the unit. He's the one giving orders directly to the companies. There's not an intermediate staff officer that he's passing through. If there is a detachment, if a colonel decides to detach a couple companies into its own separate wing or battalion within the regiment, that'll go to one of the field officers. But if the whole regiment's fighting together, that colonel is directly communicating with his 10 subordinate company commanders and controlling them in battle. There's a lot less written about the other field officers, the lieutenant colonel and the major. Both of their duties are pretty much the same in both Couts's uh, Customs and Service for Officers and the regulations. Both of them have the responsibilities to obviously take command in the absence of a higher ranking officer within the regiment. A lot of times colonels were detailed either as brigade commanders or on staff duty, things like that, where that lieutenant colonel or the major, the next senior, comes in the command. Obviously, on the battlefield, their job is to assist the colonel, to help carry out the orders that he's given to the company commanders to direct. They're going to be mounted officers, so they're going to have a much better field of vision. They're going to have a better idea of the scope of a battlefield, and they can help interpret those orders from the colonel. But again, they're not directly commanding a subunit in the battlefield. Administratively, they're in charge of commanding detachments. Couch says that a major's proper command is at least two companies for a detachment. And a lieutenant colonel's proper command is at least four companies for a detachment. They're also in charge of field officer court-martials, which are a lower form of court-martial. Even in the modern military, we have a tier of court-martials where the lower the officer's sitting on it, the more limited the scope of punishment that they're allowed to pass out. Finally, the major also has, according to the Articles of War, number 94, he's also specifically in charge of the disposition of property of officers who die in service. One additional duty for the lieutenant colonel and the major was field officer of the day. This was a brigade level position that would rotate daily through the field officers in all the regiments. And their job was to supervise the guards and pickets of the brigade. In the line of battle, the lieutenant colonel generally supervised the right wing of the battalion and the major supervised the left wing of the battalion. Next, we're gonna talk about the adjutant. 
The adjutant is the first staff officer that we're going to talk about, and he holds a very critical role in the position of the regiment. The staff of a regiment in the Civil War is vastly different than what we think of today. The modern army battalion regiment has the staff corps, S1, S2, S3, S4. That is something that comes around the turn of the 19th to 20th century that's not something that's existence in the Civil War. The adjutant is the principal organ of the commanding officer to communicate with his subordinates, according to Coutts, which I think is a great 19th century phrase, but really sums up his job. Really, the adjutant is the executive officer of the period. Today, we think of the second ranking officer in a unit as the executive officer. He's the one that coordinates with all of the department heads, staff heads, company commanders, but that's not what the lieutenant colonel of regiment does. That's what the adjutant does. The adjutant's job is to take the orders of the colonel, to write them up, distribute them, and then to assure that the orders are enforced. Interesting things that they're talking about in Couts is that he's not supposed to give specific orders in the name of his colonel. He's allowed to give general orders on a general principle where he knows what the commanding officer's mindset on that is. But in a specific case, he's not supposed to. And I think that's an important thing that the adjutant is definitely in charge because he's going to, the company commander should outrank him. He's got field officers to deal with. There's a certain amount of tech there that he's talking to people who outrank him, but passing on orders from someone who outranks them. So it's a very interesting position, also something that means that a special person fits into that role well. Someone who understands military etiquette, who's very conscientious and stands and is able to clearly and concisely pass on that information. The adjutant also has the additional role of he's essentially the bookkeeper for the unit. He's in charge of a myriad of reports that are due daily, weekly, monthly, every six monthly. And he's in charge of getting those information from the company commanders, consolidating that information with the assistance of the sergeant major and the regimental clerk, and passing it up to the colonel. Ultimately, though, it is the colonel that has to sign these to make them official. The adjutant doesn't just file them on his own. It is done, but ultimately the colonel is the one that is submitting those up to higher headquarters. The adjutant also has an additional responsibility that he's the one in charge of forming the unit. When adjutant's call is sounded, that brings the color company out to set on the line that the adjutant sets for the regiment to form on. And once the regiment is fully formed, he then passes control of it over to the colonel. He's also in charge of dress parade, guard mounts, and other activities like that. As an additional extra duty, he's the regimental treasurer, which I think is interesting, a nice parallel to the modern military that the man who controls the money is different than the man who controls the purchasing power, which in this case is the quartermaster, which we'll talk about later. The man who assists the adjutant in his duties is the sergeant major. The sergeant major is the senior non-commissioned officer in the regiment. His job ultimately is to be in charge of the sergeants. He keeps the roster of the sergeants for the regiment, and he assists wherever possible with the adjutant. He also specifically has the job of forming details and guard mounts, that he's the one that signs, that calls them off, make sure there's the proper number from each company and make sure they're properly equipped for duty. The additional duties of the Sergeant Major is he supervises the clerk and Couts also says that he's there to assist him if there's too much work to be done. He's also the timekeeper of the unit. He's the one who is supposed to set regimental time. In the absence of a principal musician, he's going to supervise the regimental musicians. Next officer that we're going to talk about is the quartermaster. Broadly, the quartermaster is dealing with three different departments within the army, the commissary, the quartermaster department, and the ordnance department. The commissary department is in charge of foodstuffs for the soldiers. The quartermaster department is in charge of uniforms, equipment, forage, transportation. And then the ordnance department is in charge of weapons, ammunition, and their various accoutrements that go with that. At the regimental level though, the quartermaster is the one officer dealing with all three of those. And part of it is because the quartermaster department is in charge of transportation. So it makes sense that those other parts, the commissary and the ordnance stores would have to go to the quartermaster for transportation distribution. The quartermaster is gonna take requisitions from companies. He consolidates them. He checks those requisitions against the needs of the company, what they're entitled to under the regulations. And he consolidates them into requisitions that are sent up to higher headquarters. But a big part of his job is to make sure that the requisitions are necessary, appropriate, and that they meet the needs of the company. He also has the responsibility for dealing with public money. Earlier we talked about the adjutant dealing with the regimental, the treasurer for the regimental fund. That's more private money. That's money that's collected as taxes from the sutler or from 
money that's sold back to the government and put in the regimental fund, but the quartermaster is gonna be in charge of the money that's given for purchasing things in lieu of what the government can provide itself. The quartermaster also has to supervise the wagon train. He has assistants that are gonna do this for him, but he's going to supervise the work details that are assigned to him. One other duty of the quartermaster is he's the one responsible for making sure that storehouses were built for all goods to be stored in and for longer term situations for the building of housing for soldiers, i.e. barracks. Uh, this isn't to mean necessarily winter quarters when individual soldiers are building them, but when, again, the regulations and all these are designed for both a peacetime military and a wartime military, when soldiers were in a position for a long time, they would build barracks and was the quartermaster was in charge of either having them built or contracting for them. And finally, he's in charge of forage and fuel for the horses and men of the regiment. One of the principal assistants for the quartermaster is going to be the quartermaster sergeant. Quartermaster sergeant is in charge of the items that are quartermaster related under the quartermaster officer. So specifically, he's the one that's going to supervise the details that are assigned to the quartermaster. Uh, he's also in charge of making all the receipts and things in his name. Finally, he's directly in charge of the regimental baggage train. One man in each company is supposed to be a wagoneer, and those men would have been grouped together and assigned under the quartermaster sergeant to deal with the regimental baggage train. The other principal assistant of the quartermaster is the commissary sergeant. So dealing with the other role of the quartermaster of distributing food, in smaller situations, he's gonna be the one taking receipt of food for the regiment and then distributing out. But more likely with the scale of men we're talking about in a regiment, he's gonna be leading work parties and supervising them to make sure the food is delivered out to the companies. He specifically is responsible for the scales, measures, and weights that are issued by the commissary department to be used for the measurement of the daily ration to ensure the soldiers are getting the right amount of food. The, ch the next person we're gonna talk about is the chaplain. The chaplain in the Civil War is there to meet the religious needs of the men. Um, his position on the staff is one that's definitely different than today's military in that he doesn't really have a rank. You know, military chaplains today are commissioned officers. They're in a staff corps of the respective services, and they're entitled to the customs and courtesies of that position. But the Civil War chaplain, though he messes with the officers, he's on the regimental staff, he's clearly an, uh, considered a gentleman, he's not really technically an officer. And that is an important distinction to make for the legality of the time and to understand their role properly. Obviously, there were chaplains that were more aggressive and warlike than others. However, they still technically weren't really officers. The chaplain's role is really ambiguous. It's kind of nebulous of how it's described. There's nothing that gives a clear list of what they're were, what they were required to do. And in reading the primary accounts about how chaplains acted in the war, there's a pretty broad spectrum of what you see them do. However, one of the things I really want to, I thought was worth pointing out is paragraph 208 of the Army Regulations says that the chaplain is required to be an ordained Christian minister. And I thought that was really interesting because when we start the war, that's not been a real big problem. But as the war continues, this actually becomes a point of contention. Arnold Fisher, from, who is originally appointed the chaplain of the 5th Pennsylvania Cavalry, was a rabbi. And his commission as a chaplain was actually disapproved by Simon Cameron, the Secretary of War in 1861. He began a lobbying campaign, including writing to Abraham Lincoln because he thought this was unfair and didn't meet the religious needs of the men in his regiment who were mostly Jewish. In the 1862, the law was actually updated to reflect that it could be any ordained um, religious figure. So I think that's an important thing to talk about is you know, making sure that the religious needs of the soldiers were met and overcoming a certain amount of 19th century preference for Christianity and things like that, that we don't always talk about in the Civil War. The next role we're gonna talk about is the surgeon. The surgeon has the rank of a major. He's broadly responsible for the medical needs of the regiment. That's gonna include one of his daily duties is conducting sick call, where the first sergeants of the companies were supposed to bring their men who were in need of medical attention to the surgeon. And the surgeon would then determine whether they'd be admitted to the hospital, treated immediately, or returned back to their company for regular duty. Some of the other responsibilities of the surgeon are to give a disposition of the case when a patient is being transferred to another hospital. The surgeon also is responsible for record keeping. He has a book of prescriptions, as well as myriad other lists of patients and description books that he's re required to keep and fill out daily. 
He also is responsible for issuing certificates of disability for soldiers or officers that are no longer able to keep up with the rigors of campaigning. An officer could resign, but an enlisted man could only get out of his enlistment if he was discharged for disability. So the, maid, the surgeon was the first person that he would go to for that. The other duties of the surgeon is to give vaccinations as required. And there's a famous case of the 20th Maine missed the Battle of Chancellorsville because they were in uh, they had been inoculated for smallpox and were in quarantine at the time. The last duty of the surgeon is to supervise the regimental hospital. Especially when not on campaign, the surgeon would have men that would de be detailed to assist him, the assistant surgeons in the hospital steward, as cooks or attendants in the hospital. And broadly, it was the regimental surgeon that was in charge of that hospital. Now, one thing is regimental surgeons oftentimes were plucked up and put onto brigade division corps staff as their medical officers. So many times the responsibilities of the surgeon fell to the assistant surgeons. Regiments were authorized to first lieutenants that were the assistant surgeons, and they had to be medical, qualified medical personnel just like the surgeon. And their responsibilities aren't well defined. However, broadly, their job is to assist the surgeon in his duties and fill in in his absence. The last person we're going to talk about on the medical staff is the hospital steward. The hospital steward is a senior non-commissioned officer, and the hospital steward's responsibilities are fairly brief in how they're described in the regulations. However, I do want to give a shout out to our friends at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine for giving some additional resources to us, including the hospital steward's manual, which talks about, a, talks about more of their duties. The hospital steward was responsible for the actual physical medical equipment assigned to the regiment, the stretchers, ambulances if assigned, the medicines and things like that, keeping them in charge. If the regimental hospital was established, they were the ones responsible for setting it up and supervising the staff. The other thing for the hospital stewards is if a larger hospital was set up, brigade, things like that, they would oftentimes be detailed to help out there. Finally, the hospital steward would be the one in charge of the musicians from the regiment during battle if they were being assigned as stretcher bearers or medical attendants, that he would be in charge of them to supervise the recovery of wounded. The last thing for a hospital steward, or the last duty, is that he is also in charge of the transportation of any wounded or sick personnel. So making sure that they were loaded on ambulances, if the ambulances were traveling at the regiment, or making sure that they were loaded in for transport to another hospital. Next person on staff we're going to talk about are the principal musician. Regiments were actually authorized two principal musicians. And the idea was that one would serve as the drum major, the leader of the fifes and drums for the field music, and the other would be the leader of the band, in charge of the regimental brass band. The regiments were authorized 24-piece brass bands. Up until the summer of 1862, the War Department issued an order mustering out the regimental bands and allowing brigades to organize their own 16-man bands from the musicians that were mustered out. The principal musicians were on par with the sergeant major. And interestingly, um, in the new army regiments of the regular army, the leader of the band was paid $75 a month by 1864, which is about the equivalent of a lieutenant. However, the principal musicians were only paid at about the same level as the sergeant major. Their job was to supervise the musicians, whether the field music or the brass band throughout the day. In the Civil War, music has a very important part in the daily life of a regiment. The sergeant major is in charge of keeping time for the regiment, but the only way that the average soldier knows what to do next or what's going on is the drum and um, music calls that are going on. So this is a really important role within the regiment, more so than I think we would think of today where bands are largely ceremonial. The custom in regiments of the pre-war Old Army was that officers would all pitch in for their principal musician in order to pay him more. A lot of times if a principal musician was there, he was a skilled, uh, he was a skilled bandsman and they wanted to make sure that they could afford the best. A lot of the regimental brass bands would be professional bands that would enlist for a period with a regiment and officers would pay the difference in the salary for a principal musician to bring in quality musicians with him. The last person that we're going to talk about in the regimental staff is the clerk. Uh, regimental, clerks on the regimental staff were private soldiers who were probably skilled with reading, writing. The armies at the time, most people were literate, but not all the soldiers were necessarily skilled and proficient at writing. 
So the clerks were there to assist the adjutant, the sergeant major, the quartermaster in filling out their returns, consolidating. Again, we talked about the vast number of returns, reports, receipts through the course of this episode. And the, frankly, the clerk is the one that's going to make that happen. And he's gonna be the one that makes all the triplicate and everything else that has to be made. This is before carbon paper and typewriters are used in the field. And all of that's gotta be done by hand. And that's really boring, arduous work. And that's a good one to give a private who has a skilled hand, but doesn't have to really think about what he's doing too much. I hope you enjoyed this journey into the regimental staff during the Civil War. I get that there is a lot of duties we talked about here, and there's a lot more that we didn't go into for time's sake and for boredom's sake. But, you know, this is just a brief look at what the responsibilities of everyone was and how it differs from today's military. Whether you're a living historian, whether you're someone just getting interested in the Civil War, or whether you're someone looking to write serious history, understanding the role of the regimental staff and how they functioned is a really important thing. As always, thank you very much for your time. I'm Andy Roscoe, and we'll catch you next time on Civil War Digital Digest.